thank you. And it's Versity. We're very, we have a difficult name to pronounce our company. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a background of what uh, Versity is working on and what our motivation is, um, it's widely accepted now that the more parents talk to, interact with their children, the higher their children's IQ will be. Um, so we can see that sort of in this little image here that just represents that as a child ages into adulthood, the brain's ability to change in response to experiences decreases and the effort to make such change increases. So it's really vital that we, that we make these changes early on. There's um, an issue now um, pretty big in the media, the, the word gap. So it's the idea that um, you can see here in this plot we have cumulative words in millions and the age of chi the child in months. So from a higher interactive household, we might expect um, this orange line here and then a lower interactive household, this blue line. And so what this is illustrating is the difference between the amount of words that a child hears if they come from a household with more interaction versus if they come from a household with less interaction. And we would see this 30 million word gap by the, child, um, by the time the child reaches 48 months. So as the child's younger, what really matters is quantity of words. But as the child ages, quality really begins to matter as the child's understanding more. Quantity we can just measure by counting words, but how do we measure quality? Um, there's different ways of doing so. Uh, one is vocabulary richness. One is uh, conversational turns. So if I talk, you talk, I talk, it's that back and forth. Um, another is the quantity of interrogatives, because interrogatives, questions, they're more engaging than just talking to the child. Um, and also the emotional state of the speaker. So it's more um, beneficial to, you know, to be happy, to sort of be interactive versus don't do that, stop, come here. So that can really affect um, the quality of interaction. So the reason we're interested in machine learning is to be able to detect these metrics now to, to focus more on quality. So to do this machine learning, we really needed to start off by just labeling our audio. So we needed ground truth so that we could train our machine learning algorithms. So I don't know if anyone went to the talk actually earlier today on um, how to get good data, but we've gone through a lot of these sort of steps that he was actually talking about. Um, starting with initial tagging methods, we, we started out with one method of seeing if we could label our ground truth. We took a pause, we, anal we analyzed our consistency, and we realized we needed to really step back and make sure we were getting the accuracy and the consistency in the labels that we needed. So this step back, we had to really figure out what we wanted from each label, what we wanted an utterance to be even, so that each person is defining a segment of speech the same way. We also needed to really simplify um, how the person is doing the transcription, so present it in a way that it's very black and white as to what we're asking of them. Um, so we developed a system we call Versatag for audio labeling, um, and then we analyzed our new results to see if we were improving. So initially, we used software called Clan, which is used a lot in the speech processing world. Um, so in Clan, you have your audio signal shown on the bottom here. And we're collecting audio from households. So we have beta testers who volunteer to submit audio. And these audio samples can be on the order of hours. So you can imagine needing to scroll through hours of audio. It's really not user friendly if you're going to be sitting there labeling the audio. So what we had the, t the transcribers do is highlight segments of speech and then they would manually enter the speaker, what the speaker said, and then whatever information we are interested in. So they'd have to enter if we're interested in background noise or emotion or different things like this. So it really was not optimized for speed, accuracy, or consistency. So after doing a couple rounds of this, that's when we stopped and we looked at how we were doing. And we realized we really needed to make some changes. So we, um, for each piece of audio, we had two transcribers label the audio because we wanted to make sure that we were getting this accuracy. So on the left, we have um, two different plots. Since there's no truth aside from what our tra transcribers are writing, we have one where we assume that transcriber was, one was the truth, and then one where we assume that transcriber two was the truth. And what we looked at here was when you're labeling speech, how many misdetections or false alarms were there? So for instance, on the left here, the blue represents missed detections. So in that case, labeler one would have said some segment of audio is speech. Label, labeler two would have said it's non-speech. And vice versa for the orange here. So it's showing just where they're misaligning and where they're even saying that speech is occurring. So even in addition to that, there's sort of different ways you can have these kinds of errors. 
One being that different transcribers actually um, thought that segment lengths could be different. So I'm up here, I'm talking to you for about 20 minutes, and someone might listen to that and say, that is 20 minutes of speech, and they can just write the whole thing if they want to on one extreme. Someone else could listen to it and say, each thought is a piece of speech, so I'm going to mark all of these thoughts as different segments. So neither one's really wrong. They're both marking speech, they're both saying what I'm saying, but the problem is we're not having that consistency. So now if we give our algorithm these two pieces of information, you know, it's, even though they're not wrong, they're not, give, they're not conveying the information in the same way. Another source of error that we found was the way people um, figured out their endpoints. So we could have people who are very generous with their endpoints and they are really capturing a lot of the non-speech after the speech ends. We could have people that are doing the opposite and cutting off the actual speech. Or what we hope for is this bottom plot where we're really just getting the speech itself. And this sort of shows what I already went into a little bit where, again, we're not really, accuracy is definitely one issue, but consistency is sort of a bigger problem that we didn't even realize at the time, where you could have 10 seconds of speech that one person says, well, there's one person talking, so that is one segment. Or you could have another person say, well, I hear each of these different thoughts, so each of these is a different segment. And again, nothing's really wrong, but there are different ways of interpreting the data. So we had to first take a big step back and just say, what is an utterance? What are we actually looking for here? Are we looking for 20 minutes of speech? Are we looking for each thought? So we stopped and we well, first had to look at our audio. And our audio in itself is really difficult because we're in a household. We're not doing red, red audio where you know, there's pretty good punctuation, pretty much set thoughts. There's chaos. There's a dog barking. There's the child. There's interruptions and overlapping speakers. So we really had to have a, a hard definition of what we're looking for. So it started with defining an utterance. And so we really wanted to make sure that people understood that wherever there is punctuation, we want that to be a segment of speech. But again, we're not dealing with red speech. There's not always a nice point of punctuation. So wherever there is a new thought, we also wanted that to be marked. So if someone gets interrupted, starts something new, well, there's no punctuation, but that's not the same thought. So we really went back to the drawing board and created a hard set of instructions for our transcribers. Another issue that we found was that um, I showed you guys clan before, and again, if we have two hours of audio, it's a little bit difficult to go through using that clan software. So we developed um, a GUI for tagging audio that we call VersaTag. And the way this works is first we um, send the audio through a speech activity detector, and so we try to segment out the audio as best we can into sections that acoustically resemble an utterance. So we try to detect where there's speech, and then we see sort of these acoustic endpoints and present that to the, the tagger, sort of one utterance at a time, or one acoustic what resembles an utterance. The user then has to determine whether that is, in fact, one speaker, one utterance, and there's sort of a different box for each one of these points, um, or whether it's one speaker with multiple utterances, whether there's multiple speakers, or whether there's TV, and it's not actually a person talking. And then because we're not, we're, our first step is not manual, there's also the chance that this could not even have speech in it at all. So we do have that option too. So we really wanted to just boil it down to something a lot more digestible by the transcriber. From there, the, the first step is just saying how many utterances, is this even speech? So the next step is the actual labeling of the audio. So we first needed to know gender, age group, and then speaker ID, um, the transcription, and then we care also if the words are mispronounced because, again, it's not red speech. There's a lot really going on, um, whether they're singing. And then we added drop-down menus for our language and for our noise. And the reason we did this was because it enables us to be more consistent in what we call a bang, a bump, or these kinds of things. We don't have different people writing a bunch of different uh, words for these noises. For TV and electronic sound, we have a separate pop-up window. So we really wanted it so that the transcriber is presented with only what they need to be presented with. So if there's no TV, we don't want them needing to deal with you know, rummaging through the TV section. So for TV electronic sound, all we care is where it happens and if there's speech in it. So that later on, we can try to figure out if we're detecting human speech versus TV speech. And this, again, helps not only the accuracy, but by not forcing them to transcribe the TV speech, we're also trying to speed up the process. Again, though, another thing we really focused on were, were the instructions, because 
the, the software itself was really important, but how we presented what the user is supposed to do is really important. So we, we came up with a training program that each transcriber has to go through, a series of videos, um, and then also a reference sheet so they can look up what to do if they reach things that they're unfamiliar with. So there's non-speech sounds, pauses, fragments, unintelligible, unintelligible speech. Um, we have all of that so they can do like a quick reference on that. And therefore, we're hopefully, again, decreasing where our, um, our discrepancies are coming between transcribers. But the big question is, did we actually do any better? That's, of course, what we care about. So now we're at our second pause, or we're now revisiting our data and seeing if we actually have seen improvements. And we have, so that's good. Um, what we're looking at here is the performance with our initial methods are on the top, and our optimized tagging methods are on the bottom. And again, similar to the plots I showed before, since the truth is really dependent on what our transcribers write, we have an instance where the first tagger is considered to be the correct tagger, so their labels are true. And then we have instances where the second tagger is the correct tagger, and they are the truth. So what we want to see is really big yellow and green sections. So the yellow is correct rejection. So that's when both of the transcribers are saying, this is not speech. The green is our correct detection. So that's where both of the transcribers are saying that a segment contains speech. And then the bad segments are the, the blue and the purple. So in blue is misdetection. So in, in this case on the left, we have transcriber one said that there was speech. Transcriber two said there was not speech. So it's considered a miss. And then again, the opposite in purple, where now transcriber one said there was uh, non-speech. Transcriber two said there was speech. So we have a false alarm. So we do see now, as we went from our initial methods to our to our VersaTag and our more rigorous definition of utterances and instructions, that we're able to decrease our misdetection errors from about 7 and 14 percent to about 5 percent for both. And our false alarms, we decrease from about 12 and 6 percent to about 4 and 5 percent. So we're not saying that we're done. We're still iterating through. But this really is a, a big step in the direction that we want to go. And for this whole thing, really, the way we've been iterating through the process is we've been working with um, different students from local high schools, universities, and they've been actually doing the tagging for us. And first of all, we now have their data to analyze. And they've been, as projects, coming back to us with their recommendations, with their concerns, with what's confusing. Um, and just that has sort of helped us get to a point of more clarity for the transcribers. So basically, our big goal, again, just to sum up today, um, is to create a wearable that really encourages parents to interact with their children. So the big thing, you know, if, if a parent's interacting more with their children, we consider that a win. But we also want to do really cool things with the audio along the way. So our first release that's coming out now is just counting words, more interaction, more quantity. Our next release is really going to focus on the data science and the quality. And that's where we're now starting our data collection so that we will have the resources necessary to do the machine learning. Um, we found Unsurprisingly, that labeling ground truth for speech is not right, wrong, not easy whatsoever. Um, so we were inspired to develop VersaTag and to develop a set, a rigorous set of instructions. And we really sort of learned the importance of just being very clear, very black and white about what we want. Um, and so we're really excited that we've already seen these improvements. We're still going to con continue this back and forth for a while until we really get to a point where we're getting that data right on. But we're already very excited with the results we've been seeing. So thank you, everyone. I don't know if we have time for questions or if anyone has any. <laughs> we have one minute. <laughs> so um, mm -hmm. let me ask you, uh, was, did you find that one area was the biggest source of confusion in your instructions in working with humans? So the first thing we really noticed was that the utterance problem, that we had people just labeling speech in every way possible, basically. So that's something that was our, our first issue that we really feel like we narrowed down. Um, now we're entering sort of a new problem where the transcription itself is, is widely different, you know, because you hear different things, some people care more about it, and that's a little bit actually more difficult to combine because it's not just time-based. Um, you can't just either take the average or, or throw it out if it's too far apart. Uh, you really have to figure out you know, what these words are and how to combine those. So that's sort of our newest headache, but the next hurdle that we're, that we're entering. Um, 
those two would be big ones. Then also noises. So people would hear a noise in the background, and one's a bump, one's a bang, one's you know. And when we're going to be parsing this later, it's possible to do if we you know. But it's a lot easier if we have a set of words that we can really look for. So little things like that along the way, we've tried to really zone in on to get them as consistent as possible. I'm sorry. Oh, Clint, yep, it's software. It's, um, it's, it's a, used a lot for sort of this kind of thing, for like visualizing audio. Um, there's a database, the Childist or Childies database, and I know they use it quite, quite regularly. Um, but yeah, it's, it's open, it's free to use. It's, I don't really know who developed it, to be honest. But yeah, no problem. Mm -hmm. Right, that, and then that was like it's sort of a thing that we didn't really expect to be as difficult as it was. We wanted to really focus instead of acoustically what's an utterance, of what sort of to a human is an utterance, so more thought-based utterances. Um, so we have places, you know, you could do a huge pause and you could still be within an utterance. So now we have framework for saying that there's a pause but saying that you're still in an utterance. So we really wanted to focus on it being a thought. So. So not necessarily, because it's, it's because we're in conversational speech, you're not really guaranteed to have like proper grammar and everything. So really, I mean, ideally, yeah, if there's a period, if there's punctuation, then you're there. But if, you know, mom starts to talk and then, and then baby's doing something and she stops and yells at the baby, well, that's a new thought because that's, she's changed even though we haven't ended a sentence. So we really wanted it to be what, like, um, based on the, what is said and not necessarily how it was said. I know the view that you can use machine learning to replace your uh, manual tech. That would be wonderful. I mean, I'd be very happy. It's the pain uh, to do the manual tagging. But um, w it would be a very, very far down the road so far that I can't quite see it yet. But that would be wonderful. I mean, the idea is once we start to, to get these, probably one step in that direction would first be to use that to suggest to a person, say, this is what we think, you know, and then they can validate that. and then. And then further down the road, once we get to a point where we're doing really well, then potentially. Um, but I would see that as like a multiple step process to get there. Yeah, yeah, so right, right now we're, we're just doing the word count for our version one, but for version two we want the wearable to be able to report back to the user sort of a report card so they can see not only the, the quantity, but also the quality of the interaction they're having. So you are hoping to be you're not quite at the point where you're able to get uh, machine learning solutions to do that, to, to actually uh, tag those other screens. Correct, yeah, so this is the first step in getting there, so it's it's, that's what we see as the future is being able to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the initial audio given for to the transcribers, is that like those, those samples are taken in a particular environment or something? Like people traveling in a car, they might be having a conversation versus they are at home. So it's, it's what we wanted it to be is as real life as possible. So we have beta testers who volunteered, and at, at this, the first step was they were using their phone, it was an app. And what we really encouraged them to do, um, we, we were reporting back to them on, on what, on how many uh, words was said in the household, but we also wanted them to really sort of set it and forget it so that natural life can happen. Um, and we're currently working on developing, um, we, we have what we call the Starling, which is a, a device clipped to the child, and that will report right now on the word count. But we're developing a research Starling so that we can gather audio now in an even more realistic environment. Um, because our device doesn't record, and we're very, like, that's big to us. We don't want it to record. But our research device will, so that we can collect the audio, and it'll be real life as the child's in the car, as the child is, you know, at his sister's soccer practice, or, or what have you. Yep. Okay. Thank you.